Hey, this is Lance from Langchain. Recently, I've been interested in applications of LangGraph that showcase some of its capabilities and complex and interesting agents. And I came across this repo that's pretty cool that I wanted to showcase here very quickly. So this is a data visualization SQL agent that does text to SQL. We've seen that before. That's kind of a common use case. But what's really neat is it actually bridges the gap between kind of natural language questioning and data visualization. So it's a text to SQL agent that not only will perform SQL queries for you, but also produce visualizations of the results for you as well. So I actually want to show this in practice first, and I'll, then I'll kind of go through and walk, walk through the repo a little bit and show how it actually works. So it's the fall in the US, people are often interested in football. I found some recent statistics from a, a machine learning model that trained on prior seasons and tried to make predictions for players this coming season. I pulled the data from Kaggle, here it is as a CSV. Now I want to show how I can use this agent to interact with it, okay? I don't like writing SQL queries, as many of us don't. So basically here is the UI for this agent that's been stood up, and I'll walk through all this in detail later, but I just want to show you how it works first. Now what's cool is I can upload either SQLite DB or just a CSV. So I'm going to go here, I'll select this CSV that I grabbed, and now this has been uploaded. And now I can just interact with it and ask questions. We see some kind of internal state being streamed here, and we get a visualization. This is pretty cool, right? So here's kind of a representation of the various players on the Detroit Lions, the projected rushing yards from this data set, right? So this is just an illustration of what's actually doing, what the output looks like. Now let's actually go under the hood and explain how this is actually working. So I'm back in the repo, and let's actually walk through the overall architecture that's shown here. So I'm the user. I gave it a CSV. And I asked a question, okay? Now let's talk through what happened. So first that CSV, go back, we can look, it was uploaded. Now what does that mean and what happened there, right? So I go to the repo, what happens is that CSV is actually sucked into a SQLite server that converts the CSV into a SQLite DB. Then I have this SQL agent here that actually interacts with that DB and queries it based upon the user's question. So basically case the question, from the front end, converts it to SQL, executes it, and returns formatted data. So that's what's happening inside this black box, which we're gonna dive in a bit later. And then that formatted data is passed back to the front end, which we see here, and then this actually renders the visualization. But all the heavy lifting is happening within this SQL agent, which is defined in LangGraph. So let's actually walk through that now. So I'm over in the repo right now. We'll see a few directories here. You see backend.js, backend.py, front end, SQLite server. Now let's do the kind of more straightforward pieces first. The SQLite server is what we talked through. This is what actually takes the CSV, in our case, and converts into a SQLite DB and serves it, makes it accessible. In fact, you can even go in the SQLite server uploads and you can actually see here's all the files I've uploaded. So I've done a few different tests with this and they're all saved here with this ID, which I can actually use later. So that's pretty neat. Cool, so that's kind of the SQLite server piece. And if you're interested in all the code, you can kind of dig into it here, but this is kind of where it all lives. I wanna talk most about the LangGraph piece. There's obviously the front end, and that's all kind of here. Now, you can choose JS or Py to implement the SQL agent in LangGraph. I prefer Py myself. So, so you can see in this My Agent subdirectory, these fit scripts contain all the logic that actually defines our agent in LangGraph. Now let's see something kind of interesting here. If you look at this overall directory, you're gonna see this langgraph.json. This actually provides the necessary config file to run our agent in LangGraph Studio. So you can see we specify our graph, we call it my agent. That points to my agent, my main.py graph. If I go to main.py, I can see here's the graph. I can go to the workflow manager here, and I can see this is actually where all the graph nodes are being added, and the graph's actually being compiled. So it's pretty nice. So if I go back, that return graph method just compiles the graph and returns it, and makes it accessible here in LangGraph Studio. Now LangGraph Studio is actually a really nice way to take this code, packages it up as the LangGraph API, which then allows us to do a few different things. 
Our code packaged up via the LangGraph API, one, we can interact with it via LangGraph Studio. So we can actually test this and interact with it directly with a visual IDE, LangGraph Studio, and we'll show that quickly. But also, I can actually work with that API and use it in our application. In particular, if I go to frontend.py, look at emvi.example, the API URL can be supplied here and it can interact directly with our locally running uh, LangGraph API via Studio. So that's kind of how this all fits together. If I kind of rewind, what's going on is backend.py or JS, the agent logic is being laid out here in a bunch of scripts. Then we have a config file for LangGraph Studio that points to our agent. When we open this in Studio, Studio will automatically wrap this code with the LangGraph API, and then it makes it accessible locally for our front end. And that's what our application is actually using. Now, why don't I go show Studio first? That's a really nice way to actually get some intuition as to how it's working under the hood. So, so here we are in Studio. My agent just refers to that agent that we defined in the LangGraph.json config file. And again, it points to our compile graph. So this gives us a way to both visualize what's going on in our graph and to actually test it. So let's show an example of this. So let's go ahead and retest the question that we asked in the UI as an example. Um, rushing yards to the lines. Cool. And this UID, now let me show you that quickly. I go back to the repo. I go ahead to the SQLite server, go to uploads, and I can actually look here at the various files that have been uploaded. So you can see these are all my IDs. They're SQLite databases. Grab the most recent one, copy that over, and here we go. So I just provide the UID right here. And I'll go ahead and ask the question, and then let's actually see this running. Cool, so it's running this parse question, unique nouns, generate SQL. Nice, so we can see this here is basically the full end-to-end -end run of effectively the back end or the SQL agent. And the final data represented right here, labels, values, and data as shown here. This is exactly what you see rendered in the UI. So the UI just takes that data from the back end, which is our agent, and does the visualization here in the front end. Pretty nice. Now let's actually talk through what it's really doing under the hood. And this is actually a great example use case for LangGraph Studio, of course. So this is a set text to SQL style flow. Now it has a few different nodes. Parse question. So what it's doing first is it's looking at the question and it's determining whether or not it's actually relevant to the table. So in this particular case, it determines, yes, it's relevant. So what the table name in this case is just CSV data. Here's the columns that it deems to be relevant to the question. So my question is player rushing yards for the lions. So basically it deems, okay, the columns I'm probably gonna need here include team, player yards, rushing yards. Now this nouns column is kind of interesting. This represents any non-numerical data uh, columns and you'll see why this is important very shortly. Okay, now next it does get this, this get unique nouns. This I had to dig into a little bit because it's not obvious, right? But it's actually intuitive when you think about it. Here's what's going on. What it's doing is it's taking these noun columns and just dumping the unique values in them, okay? So you can see it's dumping all these unique player names and team names, okay? So why is it doing that? So this is a really common problem with text to SQL that's tricky, right? Notice that my question asks lions, okay? This text to SQL process has to do a mapping between the natural language input of lions and what the database actually houses for team names, right? Those are not going to match. So this is pretty clever. I, in my C query, asked lions in lowercase l. The team names in the database actually are, you know, three uh, letter acronyms, okay? So what's interesting is text to SQL needs to do that mapping to say, I actually mean in this case, I believe it's probably DET for Detroit, right? Uh, you know, it's in here, it's, it's gonna be dumped somewhere, right? So actually, you're gonna see something kind of cool because we have all this accessible, when we do this SQL query, okay, 
we do this mapping, this is pretty cool, from what I passed as Lions to Detroit, team equals Detroit. So it figures out based on the unique nouns in the database that Lions actually refers to Detroit or D-E-T. So that's kind of cool, right? And you can see the query here, select player name or rushing yards from the data. Uh, oh, I see, select player, uh, player name rushing yards from the data where the team is Detroit and player is not null, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so it's not a crazy query in the end, but it has to do that non-obvious mapping from natural language input to the particular fields in the database. So that's like kind of where this unique nouns thing comes in. That's why you dump them all. So the SQL query generator, which is of course done by an LLM, has awareness of the team names in the database. So that's the SQL query bit. Uh, this is just like a refinement of the query, make sure it's valid SQL. Uh, well, these are the results. Uh, now, this is where things get also kind of interesting. It produces a natural language answer. So, you know, it says Gibbs and Montgomery will have a roughly equal yard. So that's kind of interesting, right? That's fine. But it also does this visualization. It chooses the right kind of visualization for the raw data. And that's a fun little thing that I actually haven't seen before. And that's kind of why I want to showcase this in the first place. It's pretty neat. So it decides, hey, based on this data, a bar graph is suitable. And then it actually reformats the data for a bar graph. And so I guess it you know creates, it determines the right structure for the given plot type. It formats it accordingly. So you can see here's like the labels, here's the the yardage or the data. And then this is what's get this is what gets piped over to the front end via the API. And that is what we then see represented here. That's kind of the flow. It's pretty fun. Uh, I definitely encourage you to explore this and play with it a little bit. Really nice example of a SQL agent that uses LangGraph, but more importantly, uses the LangGraph API to actually serve a front end that actually does the visualization. So what's kind of neat again is that, let's kind of rewind all the way back. I can go ahead and implement some agent code in LangGraph and all that's done here, right? These are all the different scripts that implement the agent itself. Once I have that, all I need to do is create this config file, langgraph.json, which basically points to the compile graph and it provides a few other things. It uses Docker, but don't worry too much about that for now. Um, points to an env file, which in this case contains a few environment variables you need. But the point is, when you have your agent logic defined, all this langgraph.json and an env uh, config file are all you need to basically spin up this as an API. It's pretty nice. Once you have it as an API, and that'll be automatically done for you in Studio, Studio serves this or gives you this URL. This basically allows you to connect to the API. And if you go over to the front end, boom, this has an env file where you just supply that URL, boom, and you're done. Then you can actually can interact with that agent via an arbitrary front end like we see here. And um, of course, what's running under the hood is the LangGraph code and it's being served and you can interact with it via the LangGraph API, which of course streams and does a bunch of other nice things. It offers persistence. So anyway, this is a nice end-to-end -end app, cool example that showcases how you can actually can not only kind of implement an agent in LangGraph, but also serve it via the LangGraph API interact with it via LangGraph Studio, and then ultimately um, kind of connect it to an external front end uh, to kind of build interesting applications. This is all running locally, but using LangGraph Cloud, you can also deploy this. So you could have this particular uh, agent backend deployed, and then you could actually build an application that's you know served and productionized using the LangGraph API. So anyway, I want to kind of show this, as, I think it's a really cool example application and I just showed this fun kind of football example because it's the fall and in the United States it's popular and there's just one example of the data types you can play with. So anyway, I encourage you to, to have a look at this. Thanks.